Okay. Hello again, everybody. I think you might have lost me for a minute there. We had a little bit of a bandwidth drama, so we should be back up and running now. Again, if you will use the facebook.com uh, slash David Nick Turn, open a second window to that page, and then you can um, write in comments there. Um, I see a comment already, so let's take a look at that. <laughs> Seth is saying hi. Hi, Seth. And... Is this where I post? Yes, Renee from Boston, that is where you post. Welcome. Let's see, Cassandra, Karen, Jen. All right, so that is where you guys have found the spot. So just please feel free at any point to just uh, pipe in a question or a comment as we go. I'm hoping that everybody's um, getting good reception at this point, using a microphone for the first time. So uh, working with obstacles, the obstacle of uh, not of hoping that we don't face obstacles is the biggest obstacle. Uh, along the way, what you might ask yourself as we're starting here, what is your expectation from your meditation practice? What do you think is going to happen to you when you practice? So that's a very interesting question because most people would approach the cushion with the notion that they're going to uh, sit down there and at the end of that session get up and something's going to be different uh, something's going to be better something's going to be calmer more peaceful so actually if some of you could type in what you think or hope will happen from your meditation practice we could maybe launch from there a little bit <clears throat> in general we could say that once we lose the primary obstacle of hoping that things will go smoothly <laughs> <laughs> which we're calling our primary obstacle. Um, we could look at meditation as a practice that is directing us towards experiencing things exactly as they are, uh, and therefore moving beyond any kind of hope or fear. So Trungpa Rinpoche used to talk a lot about hope and fear as the trap we have some kind of anticipation expectation then we have disappointment on the flip side of that so for example if you took his life into mind um, he was raised in a very um, high quality environment from a certain point of view he was discovered as the incarnation of the Trungpa Tulku when he was two years old he was treated quite strictly you know there was a lot of discipline in the practice uh, environment that he grew up in, not much nurturing really and not much playing. But still, you know, he had a featured role in society and was um, the head of a group of monasteries by the time he was 12 or 13 years old. So at I think maybe around uh, 18 or 19 with the Chinese uh, communist invasion of, of Tibet, he completely lost his homeland, barely escaped with his life, and found himself leading a group of um, refugees, diminishing group of refugees, over a mountain pass, a series of mountain passes from Tibet into India. And at a certain point they were eating their, um, they had no food left and they were cooking, ripping off pieces of their boots and cooking those pieces of the boots to just get some n nutrition out of it, some sustenance. Um, he was a refugee in India for a year or so. Came to an opportunity to go to Oxford to study. And intriguingly came upon people who were potentially interested in what he still had to present. But they had a very philosophical and metaphysical bent and treated him kind of like a uh, museum piece. So he came to the United States with a wing and a prayer, basically, and a 16-year-old British wife, new wife, and started to teach. So our whole school, if you could look at it this way, is based on this foundation of the rug being completely ripped out from under you. So our own teacher there had the rug completely ripped out from under him, and that became the sort of foundation of the whole idea of cutting through spiritual materialism and the idea 
of seeing spirituality as a comfort or cushion zone. So if we chip through the first layer, you know, there's this idea that, that our practice is going to make us more comfortable, uh, that our life will go smoothly. Arguably, meditation is being presented that way a fair amount of the time these days. And we're not saying that it's going to make your life go worse. That would be, that would be really uh, ridiculous. Um, but the idea that it's going to go conventionally smoothly, I think, is something that we're sort of cutting through right away. Very hard to let go of. <clears throat> so, as you start to practice, let me see if anybody's uh, writing in with us here. As you start to practice, wow, well, we have a lot of comments. I'll get to those in a minute. What is the practice that most of us are doing is mindfulness, right? Bringing, um, gathering ourselves into a good physical posture, bringing our attention to our breathing, and coming to a sharper, clearer focus about being present in the moment by paying attention to the breathing, noticing how much we wander off into a thicket of thoughts, um, most of which are about hope and fear. We hope this will happen, we're afraid that's going to happen. Um, or remorse and regret about the past, hope and fear about the future. If you actually cut through both of those, like if you had two swords, and here's remorse and regret about the past, stories about the past, and on the other side, hope and fear about the future, what do we have left? Like if you labeled all those thinking and then you come back to your breath, what actually do you have? So let's try that. Let's take all the thoughts about the um, past and sort of shape of who we think we are and who we become and all the thoughts about the future and the present and just let them drop away. So what we have at that point is kind of naked quality of being. Definitely you would notice the sense perceptions arising in that space. I hear the fan from my heater. Um, I can see the reflection of my glasses, the light in my glasses. <clears throat> Sound of the voice. Sensation of um, air on the skin. Feeling of tongue in the mouth. And a very open kind of quality that actually feels quite fine and quite settled. What do we expect to have happened more than that when we're sitting. Not much. So, <laughs> I'm going to take that and look at what you all have really very nicely chipped in. So let's see, a bunch of people are just saying hi. Um, Jim Chamberlain is saying, will this be recorded for later download? And the answer is yes, it's being recorded right now and it'll be available right after the, after the conversation. Terrell Harrington, hello from San Marcos. Wow, hello, greetings. Now a couple of people uh, have indicated their aspiration for practice. So Karen Schwartz, I always feel that my practice should somehow create a more synchronistic flow in my life. So Karen, I'm going to ask you if that means that only good things will happen in terms of synchronicity. Scott wants to slow the monkey mind down a bit. Okay. And Joel, Jello, 
hoping to be able to keep coming back without getting frustrated at myself for having gone off somewhere. And Cassandra, more detachment or spaciousness. That's my aspiration for my meditation. Roominess. Well, those are pretty consistent, aren't they? Sort of a lot of a lot of uh, similarity. So, um, what does come up then? Let me let me ask you. That's what you aspire to. So let's have this be a little bit of a dialogue uh, this evening. If you wouldn't mind writing in now. That's your aspiration for what happens. Now you've sat down and you're sitting there for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour or whatever you have. And what actually do you experience a fair amount of the time? And is it in line with what you're hoping for or contrary to it? Okay, so let's type in a few responses to that kind of question. Okay, we're looking. This is going to be a little bit boring for the people who who uh, um, are looking at this after the live, but I like the live part of it. So Joel has written in. Oh, this is great. Uh, Joel has written in. What she actually experiences is. Uh, resistance to returning to the breath okay and Joelle was the person who said she's hoping to be able to keep coming back without getting frustrated at myself for having gone off somewhere Cassandra is experiencing is looking for more detachment or spaciousness that's my aspiration for my meditation roominess and what is she actually experiencing lots of emotional narratives Jen is, is saying it's different most days so, I mean, that's a little vague, Jen. Could you be a little more specific what maybe what some of the things are that are coming up? And Yvonne is saying, mind with dribbles of boredom. I think the tendency here is we can see that we have one expectation and the experience is almost diametrically opposite to it. And then we evaluate our practice based on that and then we maybe feel like it's not working, kind of. So the point of view I'm going to take tonight is the obstacles, whatever you experience as the opposite of what you want to happen, is the very best news that there is. It's really, when you think of what it's an obstacle to, um, it's an obstacle to ego having control over the situation. Many of the students of meditation over the years, the serious ones who are serious enough to get into the lineage stories, um, had so much disappointment and so many obstacles, such difficulties with their teachers. <laughs> and um, there is traditionally, you know, said to be a kind of wearing down of expectation a grinding away of it and when we really look at the practice itself I think you'll see that the practice itself is free the technique is free from any sense of accomplishment or achieving anything it has nothing to do with that that's what we have to let go of to really fully enter the practice so when things are going smoothly, we tend to glide, you know, and we tend to think, oh good, my practice is working. And when things are going rough, like it's hard to actually practice, if we have a lot of physical pain, um, if we have turbulent emotions during it, uh, during the practice, then we think, I'm, I'm not doing well, I'm not making progress. So I think tonight we're sort of questioning that whole outlook towards meditation. 
And to be clear, we're not saying that it's supposed to go badly. That would be just like another um, overlay, right? But we are saying that whatever arises during the time that we choose to practice is welcomed and is appreciated and is allowed, you know. So, I mean, this is kind of a radical point of view and I'm in some way triggering off the people who are here online with, with me. When things are going smoothly, this is not necessarily the best opportunity for you to become enlightened. <laughs> and this is so uncommercial what I'm saying, isn't it? I'm thinking of all the other roaming um, dharma in the West. And here in the West, it seems that people have gotten to the point where they want to make promises about practice and frame it in a nice way that um, people will be magnetized to, to doing it within the realm of their expectation. So we started with, let's take a three, a three shot here, and some of you have gone along with the first two shots. What is it you expect and wish and aspire to have happened? Now we're just looking at this with the eyes of Prajna, right? We're just taking a look at our own framework here. Then second, what actually arises during uh, the meditation practice? And third, what do you do about it? So let's take a shot at that. In other words, let's take somebody like um, uh, Cassandra, right? I want more detachment, more spaciousness. That's my aspiration for my meditation, roominess. What I actually experience is lots of emotional narratives. And now third, what do I do with that? How, how do I work with that? And that's going to lead us to the, to the next topic, how to work with that, working with obstacles. So if a couple of you brave souls out there could write in, uh, what the third stage of your process, what do you do with it? give a minute for that. You all understand the question? I aspire to this. Strangely, I experience that and here's how I work with it with that discrepancy, with the actual experience that arises. Here's the attitude I take, here's the practice, here's what I actually do when that happens. Not what I do when it's all going smoothly and just like I thought it was supposed to. Otherwise it wouldn't be called an obstacle, would it? Okay, let's see. Okay, giving everybody a minute to write in. Okay. Let's see what we got. Ah, everybody's chickening out at this point. Huh. Well, Scott is saying that most of the time the thoughts slow down but largely depend on my attitude before sitting on the cushion frame of mind so that's the notion of fruition there is the thoughts slowing down I want to see what other people are saying I hope you understand what I'm asking you to say is what you have aspiration intention an experience arises that is contrary to that during your practice like you aspire to feel peaceful and easy you feel bored, irritated, and your knee hurts. Okay? Then, what are you going to do from there? I mean, one, one approach would be like, I'm going to quit because this doesn't work. You see how that would work? 
another approach is it's just starting to get good now. Okay, let me look and see if we have any messages. Yeah. Seth, I see that people are posting. I think I'm seeing them. Okay. All right. Here we go. Someday soon, everybody, I'll be able to see you and hear you. I, I feel this is within a year we'll be able to do it this way. So we're just kind of preparing the ground for having real dialogue. Um, okay. Great. Great. Brilliant. All right, let's start with Karen. I notice in my life when I am allowing myself to be ruled by thoughts of past, present, and try to come back to what is real in the moment. Okay, so that's awareness. There's some noticing and coming back. Jello is saying, when I encounter resistance, I try to notice what is physically tense in my body and try to soften that area so that my mind will follow. Okay. So the obstacle is being experienced as a feeling of resistance. We track it to the physical level and soften. Okay. Cassandra, when I realize I'm in the thick of that, some story of past and future, as soon as I realize, I try to focus on my breath, on the gong interval, on the inside timer, which helps bring my attention back to the moment. So you're using the gong as a, as a kind of reminder. Sometimes if I know ahead of time I'm going to be in a rough waters, I will do a guided meditation, even if it's mostly a blank tape. <laughs> kind of Zen guided instruction, it's, you just hear the tape hiss. That's really funny. I might have to put out a whole CD of that. Here's a CD of guided meditation relating to space and there's nothing on it. <laughs> there's a lot of jokes that come to my mind there. Okay, Scott is saying, try to be gentle with myself and keep up the practice. Okay, and Jen is saying, I aspire to feel grounded and centered through my practice. I experience variations on my experience. As said above, sometimes restless and bored, sometimes quiet and still. I try to stay consistent with my practice and not put too much emphasis on what my experience is in the on the day-to-day -day of it. Oh, who's your teacher? That sounds pretty good. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I think everybody's in the right, moving in the right direction here. We have, the point is, we have some inspiration, some aspiration. We have experience, which comes up. And if we relate to it, then we find a way of connecting with our actual experience and somehow hooking it back up to the inspiration whether it's more spaciousness or um, more sympathy for ourselves uh, more relaxed body so those are all really really good <clears throat> in um, talking about this kind of in the early days of the of our sangha in, in the in the US Trungpa Rinpoche formed uh, you know um, he was great at finding little language uh, bursts that would sum things up. So he talked about working with negativity, and in particular, um, <clears throat> the idea came up of negative negativity, which is, I guess, the idea, again, that we want to kill today, tonight, for hopefully the last time, that the obstacle or the negativity is something that we are not going to have to face and that we're going to avoid through practice we're going to work directly with it. So what he called negative negativity was this notion of taking a negative attitude towards whatever obstacles arise, whatever negative emotions come up, boredom, irritation, pain, and we want to eliminate those things. Right? That he called negative negativity. It's something so useful. If you really dig into practice beyond the level of just an occasional dip, you know, if somebody... Um, just takes a dip in the pool every once in a while. They don't really have to learn how to swim. So 
if our practice is just kind of a curiosity piece within our lives and just occasionally we do it but if we're starting to do it more seriously then um, the idea of what we have within the realm of our karma within the realm of our experience is going to become center stage no doubt about it right if we look at the practice as a way of avoiding that pretty quickly if we dig in it will become unavoidable it has almost a magical quality to it that way so if we then can welcome that open that and continue to practice with that and appreciate that you could call that positive negativity we're going to use all the uh, resistance all the boredom all the irritation all the emotional uh, powerful memories that come up um, all the anxiety about the future uh, all the physical tension we're going to use all of that as the object of the meditation <laughs> that becomes the object of the meditation not the thing we're trying to avoid we meditate on all of that and then it's harder obviously to bring our mind back like for example uh, the last uh, no, two years ago I did a retreat and I had a lot of pain in my back for whatever reason and I was trying to do a particular practice that is not about meditating on the pain on your back and I wished I could just get comfortable and dismiss the pain in my back and so I could focus on the practice that I was doing but it kept drawing my attention to it and I kept getting upset with my own body for resisting so strongly so I think this is the moment for me there's a second thing that happens when you have pain in your back which is your attitude towards it and your aggression towards it and your lack of patience with yourself and your lack of gentleness with yourself and um, maybe your resistance and your resentment become very intensified about being there at all so I think Jen's comment is very well taken the notion of just sort of staying with that and continuing and a couple of you have said that seems to be you know absolutely the key idea now we're going further in this talk and saying wow this is fantastic pain in the back I'm trying to meditate here I'm trying to be peaceful <laughs> I mean do you see the irony of this we're trying to be one way or another way but the heart of the meditation practice is working exactly with whatever arises and because you do that that's why it becomes more spacious that's where the space comes from so uh, you know there was a Krishnadas most of you I think saw uh, Krishnadas on with uh, on, on the show as I'm calling it and the, the TV show <laughs> um, and I think I might have related an incident where we were about, and Jen, you'll, you'll, you'll remember this, but we were about to uh, go on the stage. And it was um, tremendous thunder and lightning came up. Exactly the opposite of what you'd want. You'd want nice, beautiful, balmy weather, not too hot, not too cold. We had, you know, a couple of thousand people sitting there. And as soon as we started to play, there's this tremendous downpour and lightning and thunder. So that, you could say, that was an obstacle to the concert happening at all. And then you could track your attitude towards it. You could even get mad at the weather. <clears throat> That's how we are. We get pissed off. This is shitty weather. Well, there's no such thing, actually. Do you think, do you think a mountain says this is shitty weather? You know, because it's a storm? So weather is just natural, you know. But we had to relate to it. And that's where the resourcefulness of the warrior's approach comes in. Where you go, great, thunderstorm. And all the great teachers I know, that's the attitude they have. Fabulous, a thunderstorm. This is powerful and real and vivid. What are we going to do? So we ducked under a tarp. And then we went out to... Um, they quickly set up an indoor site and the energy was really really strong really powerful um, and we did the best we could with that situation even in, in the sense of not just accommodating it but trying to um, ride it like as if the thunderstorm came in like a kind of 
um, winged horse and you either go oh, I don't have the energy to deal with this and I was hoping for this nice sweet gooey kirtan evening or fantastic you ride the energy in that situation so we're actually going further than just saying working with obstacles we're saying we use them we use the energy in those we use our resistance to them we use the power of of the world as it's expressing itself through karma as an engine for us to to generate energy it's a it's a kind of a a, a sophisticated view so um I hope that resonates with some of you. Let me ask you to, at this point, see if you know, if you're feeling what I'm talking about here, if it makes any sense or if it's crazy. Um, and maybe respond back. And think about your life in this response, not just your sitting practice. Where, where does this set you up in your life for, for like tomorrow things are going to happen? Where, how does it, you know, how does it adjust your attitude, your vision of who you are, what you're doing? Um, so maybe this is a little more spontaneous, but people could could say, uh, jump over the fence of just trying to get a perfect meditation, little meditation practice together, and just open the gate to your whole life. You know, your relationships, your money dramas, um, your your um, work situation your physical status, what's happening with your body. How is what we're talking about related to that? Not just to having a nice little meditation session where your mind is quiet and you feel peaceful and hopefully you can put that into a lunchbox and carry it with you through the day, somehow preserve it. You could put it in a jar and preserve it. Yeah, I had, I had 20 minutes of, or within the 20 minutes I had two minutes of well-being and within that, I put that into a little jar and I put preservatives into it. And now I'm carrying it through the day and taking a little spoonful of that. Uh, it's, it's a kind of um, small view of what's possible here. So taking the idea of obstacles, bringing it in, the challenge. Can you please all comment on where does that leave us? Where does it leave you? Okay? So I'm going to give you all a moment to, to, uh, to type in because you've been so great so far in terms of this. All right, so some people are writing in uh, on, it seems to be working actually, Seth, uh, that people are writing in right uh, underneath the, uh, the Ustream post. So I'm going to answer both sets, sets of... Uh, <laughs> Let's see, this is great. It's so multidimensional what's happening here. So, <clears throat> Keen, am I, I hope I'm saying your, ni your name right, Keen Pos Posner is saying, um, participate in the obstacle in a non-attached way. I'm not sure, you, Keen, could you say one more thing about that? Because I'm not sure what that means, participate in the obstacle in a non-attached way. Um, you, you mean maybe to sort of not get caught up in it, I think. But could you just write in another comment about that? Um, and then Sarah is saying, use it to be less attached to whatever is or isn't happening in my life. In other words, when I'm less attached to how my meditation practice is or isn't going, uh, when I'm less attached to how my meditation practice is or isn't going, it's much more likely to enhance my life. And there again, maybe Sarah, you could write and say, how does that happen? Why does that enhance your life? I'm not clear about what you're saying. <laughs> and then you said, indeed, quite uncommercial. <laughs> I think Sarah's got a sense of humor there. So Julie is saying, oh, she's having trouble with her flash. Sorry, Julie. Um, all right, let me go back here and see what you've written in. So I want to reiterate, because you still have time to write in on this. The, the um, issue of jumping over the fence of just looking at the meditation practices, these 20, 30 minutes that you sit quietly, and then hoping to preserve some quality that's cultivated there and bring it into your life. Taking the attitude right directly into um, directly into your experience of living 
day by day and facing obstacles, body, speech, mind, relationships, what, how could we view those without trying to superimpose, you know, a kind of second tier of meditation-ness on top of it? How could we just experience living our lives from maybe the point of view that we're talking about here? Uh, wh whatever you think, whether it's giving it more space or being less attached or engaging it more fully, you know, I'd like to hear what your approach to living is at this point. Okay, so let's see if anybody's written in on that. Yeah, this is this is great. People are very actively engaging here, and that was the hope for this kind of live presentation. If you're watching this later on, you can just try it yourself. You know, just answer some of these questions and see what you come up with. Wow. Okay, we've got a lot here. Let's see. So Cassandra says, thanks for discussing how to deal with physical pain. Um, the aggression, the frustration, and the intensity. Yeah. That sense perception's rising is hard to experience with the perception of your sense when the perception of your senses is pain. It takes courage to let it rise and ride it rather than resist and dampen it down. It's been the best teacher. And still I struggle and I'm humbled and learning and trying. There's, uh, I think what Cassandra's saying is there's nowhere to go, really, right? Uh, Cassandra, there's, it leaves you no exit route. And there's no way to trick it or manipulate it. You just actually have to experience it. Uh, I, I know, Cassandra, I don't know if you've tuned into any of the work that John Kabat-Zinn does with, uh, you know, pain and pain management, stress reduction. I haven't really studied that myself, but you might want to look into that. Um, I have a feeling they're onto something there. Lynn Louise is saying, as for in life, when physical pain interferes with necessary functioning, how can we apply these principles? Well, I'm asking you, ironically, you know, and, and I have a feeling that among all of us, there's going to be some, some potent responses here. We're all practitioners, right? Come back to that one, Lynn. Karen is saying, I'm amazed at how I've been trying to fit things into an idealized version of what I think I want instead of letting the actual organic energy of what is evolve. Still wrapping my head around this idea. Great. Karen, thanks. That's what I'm trying to get to here is, you know, we have an idea about it and then the actual energy of life is so organic. It's like, it's like trying to talk to a plant and tell it how to grow. And I think for some of us at this point, stripping our meditation practice down even further uh, from the idealized aspect of it is going to be so helpful. That's kind of the drift of, of tonight. And Scott is saying, life is richer this way, methinks. Okay. Joel is saying, <clears throat> encountering resistance as a parent is an everyday occurrence. <laughs> we have, of course, talked about that. Riding that energy opens me to what my children need in a situation, not just trying to get my way as their parent. There was, you know, this last weekend I did this seminar that some of you were at called Work, Sex, and Money um, in New York City. Uh, and the issue of, uh, in, in, and you might want to, on the topic we're on uh, tonight, I kind of would recommend the book Work, Sex, and Money by Chogim Trungpa Rinpoche on Shambhala Publications. It's actually talks he gave in um, the early 70s. And I happened to have been fortunate enough to have been there, so it was kind of ironic for me to be talking about those. But now it's out in a book, um, uh, a kind of uh, edited version of those. And the most powerful view he's taking is that there's really no distinction between um, what we conceive of as meditation and what we conceive of as living. Um, with us, maybe a shift of perspective is what's what we can get from the practice, a shift of perspective, and that being along the lines of the negative negativity, sort of abandoning that in a way, 
and working with the organic quality of life itself and you know that changes the whole idea uh, that does cut through idealism about practice but it also is a gateway to opening up a flood of richness that's already there like what Scott is saying so he talked about um, Joel he talked about being a parent and I think you and I might have talked about this but the notion of having uh, treating your children as a guest came up being a good host and seeing them as guests means obviously that at times you have to you know uh, request that they be a good guest <laughs> and a respectful guest that's part of your job as a host is to create an environment in which people can also be good guests but the idea of not just projecting onto them our wishes and you know how we want them to behave and seeing them as a projection of ourselves so that was really kind of an eye-opener of course the other thing is your children will grow up I'm happy to report and for those of you around the New York area my children Ethan Nick Turn and I are co-teaching Shambhala training level one this weekend um, at the New York Shambhala Center if you're in the area you can come by Friday night for the um, first talk only or join us for the weekend but I now look at Ethan as a Dharma brother I was gonna say as a friend but more than that you know as a student of the same lineage and somebody who has great insight about the teachings and is a solid practitioner somebody I really enjoy talking about this kind of stuff with so the notion of our children is also connected with the idea of letting go and they grow so fast of who they used to be five minutes ago that's challenging we may be very attached to to them being you know like <laughs> and I, I recommend if you have this problem get a, 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 a puppy because as my sister said when you get a dog it's like having a baby that never grows up and you can continue to have that kind of sweet cuddly quality forever so um, when you finish with children you might try dogs everybody um, but that's a good point riding the energy opens me to what my children need in a situation not just trying to get my way well great that's some letting go there and there's some riding energy there um, Sarah is saying oh she's thinking about this now and then Scott good one Scott is could renunciation tie into this I think what we're talking about tonight is renouncing negative negativity so that's a very uh, interesting one usually uh, the conventional notion of, of, of renunciation is renouncing ne negativity and I think we're doing kind of one step further here of saying the negativity could be entirely workable fertile and organic and the the other thing that Trungpa Rinpoche is talking about is it's the f you can look at it as all those emotions as the manure of Bodhi the manure of awake mind and if you recycle it you put it back in and you don't throw it away but you transform it it becomes rich so I think we're talking about renouncing negative negativity tonight it's a particular kind of talk all right so let's see what what else we have going on here okay Wow thank you everybody for participating so wholeheartedly the very you know, at, those of you who know me know that you know that this is my favorite uh, aspect of the Dharma is just having discourse about it on you know taking some basic points and seeing and exploring what we think and feel about it so what is the name of the book um, Sarah's asking okay again the name of the book is work sex money on the path of mindfulness something with mindfulness but if you look up if you um, go to amazon.com and you google work sex money Chogyam C-H-O-G-Y-A-M Trungpa T-R-U-N-G-P-A you will find that book and I think you can download it as a you know 
Kindle or iTunes book or purchase it. Um, and that's what we're working on this weekend. It's a very potent view of not separating Dharma from everyday living. It's a, it's a powerful way of stating that beyond just a cute little idea. Um, so, ah, okay, Jen. Hi, Jen. I'm going to see you in a couple of weeks. Jen, everybody, Jen Walker plays fiddle with Krishna Das, who was on our show last week. So, Jen, I'll have to have you on the show sometime when you're when we're in the same city. Um, and um, we're going to be up at Garrison Institute um, with KD, uh, not this coming weekend, but the weekend after that. Okay, so I'll post it on the site, but hopefully we'll see some of you there in person, and we'll do some kirtan practice and have a chance to hang out. It's a really great place. So Jen said, leaves me with an aspiration to face what appears as an obstacle in life with curiosity, mm, bingo, and work to give up the idea that I actually have any idea what is good or bad. <laughs> or an opportunity or an obstacle. Less rigidity in perception, hopefully. Well, this idea of giving up, you know, if we if we spend more time talking about the lineage stories, and we maybe that's a good one actually for another talk, is talking about some of the lineage figures who are kind of archetypes of different kinds of stubborn uh, people over the centuries, you know, who tried to practice and I would say stubborn but earnest people like us, you know very much like us, like scarily like us, um, and who tried to meditate and achieve some kind of realization. And giving up had a lot to do with that happening. So that's the irony of it, is we think we're going to be able to shape this. And I think that's what we're talking about tonight, is letting go somewhat of the idea that we have about practice and really opening up to what actually arises and mixing our minds with that and learning from that. So, aspiration to face what appears as an obstacle in life with curiosity and work to give up the idea that I actually have any idea what is good or bad. I love that. Um, or an opportunity, any fixed idea. Let's, let's switch that a little bit um, because less rigidity in perception. I think if I could add a word in there, I'd say actually having a fixed idea what is good or bad because it's going to be situational. And we're not talking about amorality here. We do know what's good and bad, uh, but our fixed ideas about it are usually just an obstacle to, to the organic quality of knowing that, that way. Uh, great, Jen. Thanks. And then, Joel, I have three dogs. They keep me balanced. <laughs> yeah, three dogs and a bunch of kids and, you know, a house full of life. And then we're looking to try to find a little space to meditate which maybe is going to be a half hour a day or an hour a day or whatever we have and then the rest of the time we're relating to that house full of life so we're looking for ways you know as practitioners to relate to that right as it's happening not not to freeze dry it and take it back to the cushion and then relive it so Cassandra thanks David right you have to experience it no way around it but but no way around it but through. This is the physical pain Cassandra's talking about. But how to get through with the meditation? The practice helps by creating a space between that sensation and me. I find that the only thing is to create some space, less self-identifying, detaching the experience, the minute acute experience, from the story about the sensation of pain. Yes, I have looked into John Kabat-Zinn, very helpful. Well, that's a good recommendation then for anybody out there who is working with uh, physical ailment, painful situations. So, um, but it's like a calculus curve, always infinitely approaching, never quite touching the axis, and not getting all upset and messed up about that. One would expect to get better at it over time, but that's not the case. You know, one of the things that we used to talk about that uh, Trungpa Rinpoche used to talk about a lot is the choicelessness of what we're doing with meditation practice. Our whole life is choiceless in a way. I mean, 
it's inevitable that we're going to get sick and old and die. That's like Buddhism 101. That's not pessimism, by the way, or cynicism or neg negativity to recognize that fact. It's not intended to get somebody depressed. So that's powerful. It's what the first of four reminders. And it's what it's supposed to do is inspire us to practice now. You know, to start now, not to, not to procrastinate. So um, I feel for you, Cassandra. I hope your move, I'm looking forward, maybe you could drop me an email later to tell me how the move worked out. Um, so if there are any closing comments, I think we could, we could take a look and see if anybody else has posted. Um, wow, okay. We have an active group tonight. Mucho gusto. I wonder if anybody's listening from over, you know, outside of the United States. Would you mind just telling me right now and where you're from and what time it is there? We had somebody in Rome last week who, and it was two in the morning. Kind of very cool. So if you're listening from uh, outside of the U.S., please drop in and, and text that in and tell me where you are. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Joelle. She's saying real life on the path of mindfulness um, work sex and money real life on the path of mindfulness that's the title of the book and Seth is saying work sex money but I think we covered that already but he's printed it out so that's if you look at the scroll there between Seth and Joel we we, we have the uh, the title there so Lynn uh, is saying I think I have an answer to my own question that's makes it so um, happy for the teacher, and you know, so another thing that that Rinpoche used to say is, um, "The question is the answer." He said that over and over again, and he also said, "Your guess is as good as mine." So let's see what you're saying here, Lynn. And remember, if you're f listening from outside of the U.S., just write in and tell me that. And maybe you could do that if if you're watching uh, this later. I would like to know who you are and where you're from, so maybe you could just drop me a, a note on uh, on Facebook telling me that you saw the recording of this and where you were watching from. I'd, I'd like to just see what countries we're hitting. So Lynn says, I think I have an answer to my own question about how to apply these principles when we have physical pain that interferes with necessary functioning. Sometimes it just might require excusing ourselves, just as we would call in sick. But use this time to meditate and work with it and move back into life a little more slowly, a little more mindfully, a little more compassionate with ourselves and our bodies. Wow. Awesome, Lynn. As Pema Chodron teaches, perhaps it is to let go of seeking to not be in pain and work to accept the pain. So, you know, this also comes back to me uh, connecting some dots here of something Joel said earlier of feeling the body and softening around tension because when we have pain the muscles tighten up around that area they're trying to contain it so my experience of sitting for example I sometimes mix in instructions that I've had from Sat Han, my Tai Chi teacher to just release and soften so a lot of times people are sitting too stiffly, you know, have the kind of this kind of notion of sitting. And I, I've said this before, but the idea of then finding any tense area and just releasing it. Now that doesn't mean this. It could mean doing that for a minute and just releasing the lower back. But then when you come up and just let everything soften and actually scan for areas that are not. It could be your jaw is too tight and the muscles around the ears, scalp. And you might want to try sometime just doing that kind of body scan and softening if you're having a lot of pain doing sitting meditation. A lot of it's mental tension. Not, I'm not talking about the chronic illness that some of you are talking about. But the, the pain during sitting, some of it is, is uh, you'll, you'll see, it'll come and go with, well, it'll come and go, which is interesting. If it was real hardcore physical pain, it wouldn't go. It would just intensify. But if we release the areas around the tension, and allow ourselves to breathe and to be. And I think what Lynn is saying here is that um, the idea of being kind to ourselves, 
compassionate to ourselves, even in terms of like negotiating our relationship to others and to the world and saying, I, I need a little time here. I need space to do this. I need to not push, you know, you, if you look at it as volleyball, you know, you can't always be spiking the ball. Sometimes you're just setting it up, you're just hitting it back, and there has to be some pace to our game, even if we're meditation practitioners. We can't be at 10. It's <laughs> like spinal tap. You know, the guitar's up at 10 all the time. 11, I mean. We can't be meditating at 11 all the time. So maybe, you know, between 4 and 8 would be good. So I'm going to see if anybody wrote in from where they are before we wrap it up. We've sort of set a time of about an hour to have these kind of conversations. And I think some people did. We'll see. <laughs> okay, maybe we don't have anybody from Europe or, or South America. But if you do watch the recorded, and you can send me a little Facebook message, I would love to hear from you on that account. Uh, Cassandra, you're welcome. Pleasure. And I'm going to be talking to you directly soon. Some of you, just to let everybody know, some of you I'm working with one-to-one -one via Skype. If you're interested in doing that, um, or, or live if you're in New York City, um, that situation is, is available. And all you'd have to do again is Facebook me a message and say, I'm, could I find out about that? And I'll explain how that works. So I'm inviting you if you want to explore that. And uh, Lynn, I love that. Life is like a volleyball game. You can't be spiking the ball all the time. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I mean, you know, I hesitate to use the massive sports metaphors and analogies that naturally come to my mind, but I'm so happy that one worked. <laughs> and, um, you know, a metaphor is something you can win or lose with. So, um, but it's such a great way of talking about stuff. So I want to thank you all for participating tonight. It, this felt very uh, uh, heartwarming for me to know that you're all out there, and I know quite a few of you um, either virtually or in, in, in real life. Um, so I will be doing this again next week. Maybe during the week if there's any topic that you want us to focus on uh, for our virtual Dharma group, you could write that in. Uh, again, Facebook message and or email. You can email me at davidnickturn at gmail.com, too. Um, I'll, I'll post that, too. So I'll write that right here. So if you have any questions about the topics coming up or even follow up on what we just discussed <clears throat> or exploring the one-to-one, -one, just go ahead and you can just drop me an email there. Um, Seth will kill me if I spell my name wrong. I didn't. That's good. So signing off for now, uh, wherever you are, I hope you're having a really uh, good evening or afternoon. And um, all best wishes. <laughs>